Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to be here in Florida, as opposed to York, where it's 12 degrees and raining. It's merely 30 degrees and raining here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing at Ferro on the polar pesticides, the ion exchange chromatography, tandem mist spectrometry. It started off as a tail of two molecules and then progressed on to something slightly more. I'll give you a quick introduction to Ferro Science Limited, what we do. We'll talk about some of the topic polar pesticides that we've got. We'll run through the quick universal polar pesticide extraction method, or CUP. We'll look at the ion chromatography mass spectrometry instrumentation we've got, and I'll show you some of the results that we're achieving at Ferro, and then we'll run through a quick summary. What is Ferro Science Limited? We look for scientific solutions from the farm to the fork, so right from the cow to when the steak arrives on your plate and just about goes into your mouth, we study the science through the whole food chain. We've established 100 years of science, and in on the average year, there's about 600 research and development projects run within the organization. We take in over 100,000 samples a year, looking for pesticides in your potatoes to pests on your potatoes. Science is never done in isolation. So we have approximately 1,000 active collaborative partners in a year. We're the Naf National Reference Laboratory for many of the chemical tests. We work in a GLP, an ISO-compliant facility. And if that isn't enough, we also have an emergency contingency capability just in case something goes wrong. So polar pesticides, are they in fact old news? If you'd asked me this nine years ago, I'd have probably said yes, I thought they were. Uh, last month, the EU reapproved glyphosate for use for 18 months only, pending scientific information being provided to them. Uh, that was on the back of 2015, the World Health Organization moved to classify glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. Uh, one of my other favorite compounds, ethophone, it's a growth regulator and it's quite often used to ripen up grapes. It's approved, but frequently we get MRL violations. So currently up till June this year, there has been seven notifications and alerts in the European Union rapid alerting system covering grapes, tomatoes, peppers, and all things figs. Uh, chlorate, banned in 2010 because of its health risks, banned as a pesticide, and it's still regulated as a pesticide. Uh, European Food Sta uh, Safety Agency called for more data on the presence of chlorate in foods, and I've spent a lot of time in the past couple of years actually doing the analysis. Uh, perchlorate, again identified as another problem, the EU established MRLs of 10 micrograms per kilogram for most of the food substances that we look for. A recent report by the FDA reckoned that 47% of the total exposure is coming from milk, so dairy is very important. Just to point out, at the moment, or two years ago, these were all single residue methods. Where are we going with this? Coop, the perfect extraction method, basically very good for vegetables. If you've got things like cereals, you need to add water to hydrate it. There isn't any participation. There's no cleanup. Um, it's not perfect. Why is it not perfect? Well, your extractions contain large amounts of co-extractives, you get variations in retention time depending on what mobile phases and what columns you're using. Internal standards are almost, almost always required, and you require several different, column, several different column chemistries and different columns to actually get all the analytes in the method. So why would we be using this if this doesn't work? Well, like all methods, it's continually evolving. Version 9 was released at the start of this year. It's cost effective, it's that fantastic word, it's cost effective to a lot of previous approaches. Glyphosate at Ferro used to take a day and a half in the extraction lab, probably about a night in the instrument and a half a day data processing. Now we're half a day in the extraction lab, overnight running the instrument and possibly a couple of hours doing the data handling, so we're getting better. It also allows the analysis of less frequently monitored pesticides. Glyphosate, one of the most heavily used pesticides in the world, one of the least analysed for. And because of the pressure for some of the internal standards to become available, lo and behold, they have listened and they are now becoming available. So as I say, I started this in 2007, the excitement of getting good shape peaks, put, but we had to put on two and a half mils of extract. We used online concentration. Now, 2016, 
we dilute the extracts one in 10, and we put on 100 microliters. Uh, depends which one you want. I quite like the one in the right. The one in the left was a lot more work, two software packages, two separate instruments, uh, and one wire connecting them. So what does the ICMS MS look, at, look like at Ferra today? We're lucky that we're evaluating the thermal ICS 5000 system. We've got it connected to a thermal Quantiva. Uh, and we've got one control software package. Now, people think that's a bit strange, but when I started, there was two control software packages that never talked to each other. Uh, as I say, we did a lot of single residue methods. Now, with Qu we're actually starting to head towards the multi-residue analysis stage. IC started to catch up with some of the UPLC developments, and we've got new generation of IC columns with a much smaller particle size. Uh, the mass spectrometer is actually it's optimized for low mass transition. So we've got a mass spectrometer that can deal with the low masses. So this gives us higher sensitivity, which means we can drop the injection volume we've got. Uh, because we're not doing any cleanups, one of the key critical points is that we can actually change the ion transfer tube, the tube that transmits your ions from your ion source into the start of your quadrupoles. We can change that without switching the system, taking it on, out of vacuum. So it takes minutes as opposed to maybe hours to days to do. The configuration is slightly different. There's a few key points. You'll notice that there's a, a non-metallic pump because we add, all we do is put water into the system. We then pass it through the eluent generator here, which in our case produces hydroxide ions, which then flows into the auto sampling system. We put the sample in. We do an anion separation on a, an AS19 column, and then there's this very important little box at the end called the electrolytic suppressor. Because we've put potassium hydroxide into the system, and you're all keen mass spectrometers, you'll notice it's not a volatile salt. We have to take that out. So by neutralizing the hydroxide, we take away the salt component in the mobile phase, and we're left with pure water. We then flow that through the conductivity detector, which tells us if there's lots of hydroxide, the conductivity goes up, a feedback loop activates, and we shut the system down. That never happens now. It happened twice in the start in 2007 and was a bit exciting, so we dealt with that problem. So we flow the water directly into the mass spectrometer, but we found out if you put acetonitrile in to help your desolvation, you get a fourfold increase in your response for most of your compounds. So it's all very good. This is all the theory. Does it actually work in practice? Well, we picked cereals because they're not particularly nice to deal with. You have to hydrate them. And for seven compounds, we've got a perchlorate, chlorate, ethophon, chlorperalid. We've got good recoveries and we've got good relative standard deviations. If you notice, phosphatile aluminium and phosphonic acid, we've got much higher spike levels for when we're doing the validations, merely to reflect that their MRLs are significantly higher than the other compounds. And with the exception of phosphatile aluminium at 200 micrograms per kilogram, we've got recoveries within inside the Santé guidelines, and we've got exceptionally good relative standard deviations. Uh, you'll notice that cyanic acid is a bit the response is variable down at the bottom level, and that's something we're still working to address. But you'll also notice there's a combination of internally standardised and not internally standardised. But we don't just do a few compounds; we do a few more. So one of the things that I've been continually asked, can you do glyphosate? And then the next question is, can you do glyphosate? The answer is, yes, we can do glyphosate. Uh, and yes, we can do glyphosate. Again, we've got good recoveries, good relative standard deviation. And also, we've got very good peak shape, nice Gaussian. When I started, peak shape would be about three, four minutes wide. Now we're heading towards the peak shape, is at, the peak's width is actually about a minute wide. And this is improving, and it can only get better as the column technology improves. Uh, glyphosate, everybody's favorite. Wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention my old friend glyphosate. Again, we've got good recoveries, we've got good relative standard deviations. Apart from AMPA, down at the bottom end at 10 microgram per kilogram, it's slightly more variation. But again, we didn't have an internal standard available when we did the work. Again, we've got tiny little bits of residue in the blank. I put them to scale so you could see them against the 50 microgram per kilogram spike, so we're not hiding anything. So the flower wasn't squeaky clean, it was merely clean when we did the validation work. 
What does the retention time stability look like? I mentioned at the start, you get some variation in your retention time. Well, we measured it over one of the batches, and we lost 0.13 of a minute throughout what I would call a standard run, which is basically the instrument running overnight. 0.13, uh, Sanko guidelines state your sample should be within plus or minus 0.1 minute. So all was good. We're also using internal standards to correct for any retention time drift, but we're not seeing significant drift. And the small drift that we have got is very predictable. But you say, an overnight run, is that really enough? Well, we had a bit of a break and we fed the instrument some beer. So we did a very simple beer to gas dilute inject in the system. And we got, over the two and a half days we had the instrument continually running, we lost 0.3 minutes on the retention time. Again, as you can see, very steady, very predictable downward pattern. Uh, and while we're there, we decided we'd actually just check to see what the concentrations were in the beer because we noticed that the Germans were publishing results saying there was glyphosate in the beer. So we diluted the beer with water, put some internal standard in it, and calculated one of our favorite beverages had 0.58 micrograms per liter in it. We've got this, EU drinking water directorate says 0.1 microgram per liter, but I don't drink beer morning, noon, and night, so I'm fairly confident that I'm safe. <laughs> um, Ethophon, again, one of first time ever analyzed ethophones five years ago. The first thing we did was discover an MRL exceedance in this first sample. So we thought we'd try it in the method for ethophone in grapes. Again, good recoveries, good relative standard deviations, good calibration, good signal to noise for both channels. Always good. And then we started looking at some of the more interesting compounds that don't necessarily, people would associate with them being a pesticide, but they're still of interest and very topical. Here we've got chlorate and dairy products. We routinely calibrate five to 100 microgram per kilogram, uh, good calibrations, uh, and we've got exceptionally good signal to noise for a quantification transition at the top, 83.1 to 66.9, and the two confirmation transitions that we use. But again, we don't just do chlorate, now we do chlorate and perchlorate together. So again, we calibrate from five to 100 micrograms per kilogram. We've got a very good correlation coefficient in the calibration, and we have got a very good signal to noise ratio for our transition, our quantification transition, 66 to 82.9, and for the three confirmation transitions that we're using. And then we decided we'd go a little bit further. We'd look at things in baby food we tried to pick the dirtiest matrix we could find in the baby food, so we actually decided we would analyze creamy porridge, which has got oats, cereals, dairy, so it's a mix of things in it. When we started looking at it, you can see that we're not trying to hide that the blank is clean. What we did do was we did a standard addition on the blank to find out how much perchlorate was in it. Values came back at two micrograms per kilogram, which you can see in the blank chromatogram. We then said, well, we're going to spike in at 5, 10, and 50 micrograms per kilogram. So we spiked in at those levels. And we've got good recoveries. And you'll notice we have got excellent relative standard deviations, and we've got an excellent calibration. So even at 2 micrograms per kilogram, we're detecting perchlorate. And even at the higher levels, we're confident that we'll get a, a good value because the relative standard deviation is so tight. That also indicates to us that the sample is homogeneous so we haven't picked up a random bit of cheese and got a hot spot. We've got a, a nice homogeneous sample to use. But again, we didn't just look for chlorate, for perchlorate. We also look for chlorate. And one of the things I've, I'm in the mindset of, it's an organic sample. There can't possibly be anything in it. But then I, the, me, the brain starts saying, it's an organic pesticide-free sample. It's not free from other contaminants. So we're doing the work. We found chlorate at a good level, at 38 micrograms per kilogram. And we thought, I thought for this talk, should I hide that? I said, no, that's actually quite a valuable bit of information to put in that we can actually find chlorate in baby food. And this is at the levels. And this will be a challenge when you actually go to, to validate these methods when you're looking at infant foods. But again, we didn't just look for perchlorate and chlorate. We actually looked for glyphosate itself. Uh, and again, you can see we've got your blank chromatogram. We've actually got 
about 10% of the response of the bottom spikes we're presenting, we've got the response in the blank. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, why are we finding this? Well, basically, because before we've never looked this low, we've never had the right setup, the right extraction, and the right equipment. So again, why hide it? It's something to say that there's a potential for a very small residue in the blank. But if you imagine the MRL is actually at 10 micrograms per kilogram, we can quite clearly differentiate between the potential background and the actual residue that's in the sample. Again, we've got good, relative, uh, we've got good mean recoveries with inside the Santee guidelines of 70 to 120 percent, and we've got good mean relative standard deviations. And that was a quick walk through iron chromatography. I was told to do this very quickly, and I've obviously sped up slightly during the process. Um, but in summary, we have got two, we've got an in-house validated method for 13 of the polar pesticides over the two commodity groups. We routinely in the laboratory run chlorate and perchlorate using the quippy methods. The infant food you'll notice is a bit more challenging for us, uh, and we're still working towards fixing some of those challenges. There's a quippy method listed for animal products, and it's the discussion to have whether infant food with dairy in it is in fact an animal product and we should be doing something slightly different or should we be trying to use the generic quip methods. There's good selectivity and sensitivity for the validated pesticide commodity combinations we've got and we're very happy with the results we're getting. And the beautiful thing about science is it's never done in isolation. I, didn't, I wasn't locked in a lab for four weeks and told you're not coming out so something works. I was working with a team of people at Ferra so to acknowledge Jonathan Guest and Mike Dickinson for all their help, support and discussions on the topic. And also to Jonathan Beck, Fran Schutzen and Richard Fussell at Thermal who supported us during the development of this application. Um, and when we leave the lab at night, it's, you get a nice lovely sunset. And I'd just like to say, have you got any questions?